Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are ready to get going uh, in our small business <clears throat> committee hearings. Before we uh, bang the gavel and begin our proceedings, uh, I want to recognize the uh, <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> chairman of the full committee, Roger Williams, to lead us in the pledge and the prayer. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> so good morning, everyone. We now call the Committee on Small Business to order. Without objection, the Chair is authorized to declare a recess of the Committee at any time. I now recognize myself for my opening statement. Again, we want to welcome everyone to today's hearing, including the ranking member. <laughs> uh, and first, I do want to thank our witnesses for joining us uh, here today. Your time is very much appreciated, and we look forward to your testimonies. Uh, today, our committee, the Subcommittee on Economic Growth, Tax, and Capital Access, will focus on the current function and future of both the SBIC and SBIR programs. Unlike large corporations, small businesses don't share the luxury of utilizing debt and equity markets for financing. Main Street is instead forced to bridge the funding gap and utilize resources like SBIC programs where federal funding is matched with experienced private investors at no risk to the American taxpayer. And SBIC is a privately owned company that's licensed and regulated by the SBA. SBIC has raised capital to invest in small businesses in the form of debt and equity. The SBA does, it doesn't invest directly into small businesses, but it does provide matching funds in the form of loans to, to qualified SBICs with expertise in certain sectors or industries. Those SBICs then use their private funds along with the SBA guaranteed loan to invest in small businesses. Through the SBIR and STTR programs, Main Street is also given the ability to develop and commercialize new products for both government and private sector. For example, SBIR works by infusing federal R&D dollars in phases to small businesses, developing new ideas that align with the needs of the federal agency. Federal agencies can offer SBIR and STTR awards by either requesting a product that meets specific requirements or by an open topic in which small businesses propose innovative solutions to meet an agency's mission. The flexibility of open topics allows small businesses to propose new solutions that help agencies meet their mission. <clears throat> the access to and utilization of these two programs is essential to helping many small businesses navigate economic challenges set upon them by Bidenomics and some um, what one might describe as wasteful, excessive government spending. As we know, it is more expensive than ever to do business because of high interest rates, persistent inflation, and newly proposed banking regulations, such as Basel III, which have forced banks, uh, as we speak, of all sizes to tighten commercial lending standards. In order to ensure small businesses have continued access to capital, this committee must work to reauthorize the SBIR and STTR programs expiring at the end of next September. Our first duty is to address challenges within the program and explore various solutions that were left on the table during the program's last reauthorization. As leading voices for Main Street, it is our job to work to ensure our nation's job creators have an economic and regulatory environment they can not only survive, but thrive in. Reauthorization is crucial, but not without necessary adjustments regarding flaws like the current CCP infiltration into the SBIR program. During 2022, SBIR uh, and STTR reauthorization, uh, Democrats did not consider the threat China posed in the SBIR, STTR, as a serious concern. Republicans successfully fought to combat Chinese infiltration by requiring agencies to develop a due diligence program. While this program has since assessed security risks, Congress has an opportunity to address weaknesses in the due diligence efforts as their effectiveness is further evaluated. 
as we look to the future of the SBIC, NESBIR, NSTTR programs, one thing remains abundantly clear. We must continue to fight for Main Street and work to empower our job creators with common sense, regulatory relief, and reliable methods of access to capital. These businesses, especially those developing innovative products for federal agencies, work to advance everything from our national security to our education system. We rely on them and their innovation to ensure the U.S. remains a global leader for products across the board. Prioritizing their success and continually motivating their output is essential to America's continued advancement. With that, I will now yield to our ranking member, Mr. Landsman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for uh, holding the, this very important hearing, and thank you to all of our uh, guests for being here. Uh, your time is very important, and we uh, truly appreciate your perspective uh, and, and, and advice. Uh, the hearing really couldn't have come at a better time. We're seeing a record surge in new startup activity, and it's happening at this really important uh, point in our nation's history where uh, working, as, as the chair said, to uh, uh, evaluate, reevaluate, in some instances, the role of our startups uh, in the global supply chain and uh, the way in which we source products uh, that are critical to our economy and uh, our national security. Uh, we all know that innovation is a, is a catalyst for economic growth and resilience, and oftentimes the most innovative ideas come from our startup communities. Uh, however, these startups often struggle to grow their ideas and be part of uh, the uh, economy uh, because they just don't have uh, the capital. Uh, that they need. It takes time uh, and, and money to turn their innovations into real products. To help, uh, we have prioritized investing in these new startups through important programs at the SBA. Uh, the SBA's Office of Investment and Innovation houses uh, two of these uh, programs that we're talking about, uh, the SBIC and <coughs> the SBIR. Together, uh, these programs help uh, startups research and develop new products and help uh, high growth companies in disadvantaged communities access private equity uh, capital to grow and scale their business. Uh, let's start with the SBR, uh, SBIR program, uh, which creates this partnership between federal agencies and startups to develop technologies to support our economy and national security. This program uses a small percentage of, uh, of research and development spending through highly competitive grants. Uh, this program have, has helped start up uh, businesses like 23andMe, Sonacare, uh, LASIK, and uh, could bring many more promising ideas to the marketplace. Uh, in uh, FY 2020 uh, alone, these programs backed more than 4,000 small businesses and 7,200 projects. Uh, but uh, developing technology is only the first step as many businesses with great products face other reasonable barriers to funding. That's why Congress created the SBIC program in 1958 to enhance small business access uh, to patient capital. Under this program, the SBA works with uh, and licenses private institutions to provide financial uh, financing to small high growth companies. In the past, these investments has, have acted, uh, believe it or not, as a lifeline to firms that have changed the course of history, companies like Apple, Costco, FedEx, and Intel. Now there are over 300 SBICs. In 2023, they provided $8 billion to over 100, uh, 1,200 startups. This helped create uh, and keep more than 130,000 jobs. Uh, despite the overwhelming success of these programs, some modernizations uh, need to be made. Uh, just last year, the SBA finalized the SBIC investment uh, diversification and growth rule. The rule updated the program and created two new types of SBICs to create uh, greater flexibility in investment repayment opportunities for firms that may not have fit under the traditional rules. Uh, we are also just over a year away from another reauthorization of the SBIR program. It's uh, my hope uh, that we work together in a bipartisan fashion to address gaps in the program like better serving women and minority-owned businesses that have unfortunately been left out of the program in the past. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank the chairman for holding these hearings, as well as the witnesses for being here today. I look forward to a productive conversation about the state of these programs and hearing ideas to strengthen them, and I yield back.
Ranking member yields back. I now recognize the chairman of the full committee from the great state of Texas, Chairman Roger Williams, for an opening statement. Well, thank you, Chairman, and good morning to everyone here today. I want to thank Chairman Muser for uh, holding today's subcommittee hearing that will examine the impact and effectiveness of the SBIC and the SBIR programs. Main Street. Main Street is forced uh, faced with a continual disadvantage when it comes to accessing capital. With burdensome regulations and high interest rates, banks are being forced to tighten their lending standards. And when this happens, small businesses are often the ones forced to pay the higher price to much-needed funds. Now, this is where the SBA steps up to fill these gaps. Uh, through the SBIC and the SBIR programs, Main Street is uh, able to access funds that will help them grow and expand their operations. These programs have proven to be successful for a wide variety of businesses in almost every industry. As the authorizing uh, committee of both of these programs, it is our duty to evaluate what is working and what could be done better to ensure that they are helping as many entrepreneurs as possible. I'm looking forward to hearing directly from our witnesses today and appreciate all of them being here uh, so we can learn from their firsthand experiences in navigating the SBIC and the SBR programs. So I want to thank all, all of our witnesses for being here, for coming here on your own time, and uh, to be with us. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> I will now introduce our witnesses. Our first witness here with us today is Mr. Angelo Valletta. Mr. Valletta is the President and CEO of Ben Franklin Technology Partners of Northeastern Pennsylvania. I know that neck of the woods a little bit. Located in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Since 2021, Mr. Valletta has been with Ben Franklin Technology Partners of Northeastern Pennsylvania, which provides investment capital and business support services to both technology startups and established manufacturers. Prior to his current position, Mr. Valletta held several executive leadership roles at FIS Global, one of the largest fintechs in the world. He also served as Senior Vice President and Chief Bank Operations and Information Officer at Sun National Bank. Mr. Valletta earned his Bachelor of Business Administration from the Fox School of Business at Temple University before going on to his Master of Business Administration from Philadelphia University. Thank you for joining us uh, here today. Our next witness is Ms. Amanda Bresler. Uh, Ms. Bressler is the Chief Strategy Officer of PW Communications, located in Rockville, Maryland. <clears throat> PW Communica Communications provides full-service proposal preparation, contract performance, and strategic business development support to companies. At PW Communications, Ms. Bressler has used government data to analyze the impact of federal procurement programs, including SBIR, on small businesses. Ms. Bressler currently serves as the Global Board of Directors, for Alma Links, a global community that connects Jewish CEOs, founders, and seasoned executives to business leaders from Israel and around the world. Ms. Bressler attended the Georgetown University McDonough School of Business, where she earned her degree in marketing. Thank you for joining us here today. Our next witness uh, with us is Mr. Brett Palmer. Mr. Palmer is the president of the SBIC Alliance, Small Business Investor Alliance, located here in Washington. For over 15 years, Mr. Palmer has served as president of the Small Business Investor Alliance, which does represent a variety of funds investing in American private small businesses, including the SBIC companies and private equity funds. Prior to his current position, Mr. Palmer was managing director of government relations for the National Association of Insurance Commissioners, as well as an assistant secretary of legislative and government affairs and deputy assistant secretary for trade legislation in the U.S. Department of Commerce. Mr. Palmer was recently appointed to the Small Business Administration's Investment Capital Advisory Committee. Mr. Palmer earned his degree in history from Davidson College. Thank you very much for joining us today. I now recognize the ranking member from Ohio, Mr. Landsman, to briefly, you have to be so brief, but introduce our last witness appearing before us today. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our final witness today is Mr. Jared Glover, uh, the Executive Director of the Small Business Technology Council, SBTC. Uh, a trade association of small, high-tech companies, most of whom are involved in the Small Business Innovation Research, or SBIR, program. Mr. Glover uh, is considered one of the fathers of the SBIR program. Uh, as counsel to the House Small Business Committee, he directed and organized a set of hearings on small business uh, and innovation that led the groundwork for the program in 1978. Uh, throughout the uh, law's existence, he has been one of its most active supporters. 
Uh, Mr. Glover has a unique blend of public, serv- uh, public and private sector experience. Uh, for more than six years, he was the federal government's lead defender of small businesses in the regulatory process in the private sector. He has been the CEO or principal of a biotech company, a medical technology company, and a group of medical uh, clinics. Uh, He obtained his undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Memphis and uh, an LLM in in administrative law and economic regulation from George Washington University. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Glover. We look forward to your testimony. Well, before recognizing the witnesses uh, for your opening statements, I would like to remind you all that your oral testimony is restricted to five minutes in length. If you see the light turn red in front of you, it means your five minutes have concluded and you should wrap up your testimony. If you start hearing this, it means you should really consider wrapping it up because I don't want to have to wrap this too hard. All right. Uh, I do now recognize Mr. Valletta for his five minute opening remarks. Good morning, Chairman Williams, Chairman uh, Muser, and the esteemed members of the subcommittee. I'm Angelo Valletta, President and CEO of Ben Franklin of Northeastern Pennsylvania and chair of the Ben Franklin Technology Partners. I'm honored to be here today to testify about the SBIR and SBIC's program's impact. Ben Franklin has been investing in supporting early stage technology focused startups, innovative manufacturers and technology incubators for over 40 years and generates $4 for every $1 invested and has supported SBIR and SBIC programs for many years. These programs are often referred to as America's Seed Fund. These programs are a valuable source of capital to help small businesses commercialize research into useful, launchable products and services. Ben Franklin has supported these companies through our statewide program called Innovation Partnership, IPART for short. Pennsylvania companies have been successful in leveraging SBIR programs with PA ranking seventh among participating states. PA's IPART assists primarily first-time SBIR applicants and has a 28% success rate versus the national average of 18%. Our relationship with SBIC program is in partnership with licensed SBIC firms. We have invested in SBICs, evaluated SBIC licenses, and leveraged separate for-profit funds. Regulations have limited the use of the SBIC program for early-stage investments. We believe the SBIR and SBIC programs are valuable resources to grow small businesses that translate into highly paid, sustainable jobs for the communities that we serve. SBICs use a rigorous analysis of managers' backgrounds and investing experience and an evaluation of the fund's investment thesis, strategy, and structure. The application process to secure an SBI license can be lengthy and difficult, but it has many benefits. Pennsylvania's SBICs have invested in 84 PA companies in the last 15 years. Of these investments, 81 were in mezzanine, debt, private equity, or other later stage capital facilities, but only three deals by the same investor were in early stage funds. Last year, SBA overhauled aspects of the SBIC capital regulations. SBA made several positive revisions to renew the approval process for new SBIC applicants, such as expanding capital, considering the fund's management team's expertise in capital activity, are open to smaller SBIC investments, and finally have lowered its fees and streamlined the committee review for newer program applicants. These positive reforms are significant improvements to the SBIC program, and as such, Ben Franklin is considering an SBIC license for its GoPA fund. Ben Franklin is happy to see SBA implementing the alternative funding structures to supply additional capital for early stage investing. However, several hurdles remain. SBICs are required to be for profit. The size of over three million can still be a challenge. And finally, the limitation of leverageable capital could be better defined. SBIR and STTR programs are referred to as the nation's largest source of early stage high risk funding for startups and small businesses. Again, PA ranking seventh in the amount of SBIRs awarded annually. In the last five years, over 1,200 companies received phase one and phase two awards, totaling nearly $850 million in funding, and the Ben Franklin Network investing in nearly 25% of them, with 27 invested by our IPART program. There is merit to having the SBIR and STTR awards distributed by a rigorous proposal process, but there is some room for improvement. 
with over 20 years of assisting small businesses seeking awards, IPART assists many clients submitting proposals for funding. SBIR and STTR agencies could require a similar preliminary phase one pre-submission project focused document for agency specific vetting and could be standardized to streamline the application experience and to avoid duplicate proposal submission. Furthermore, SBA could coordinate solicitation, registration requirements, and timing of feedback through a single information channel that would significantly enhance the experience of companies seeking awards, increase the number of companies seeking SBIR and STTR awards, and would likely improve the submission's quality. I thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Chairman Williams, Chairman Muser, Ranking Member Landsman, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Amanda Bressler, and I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for PW Communications. My firm has won SBIR awards from the Department of Defense, and I have published five independent research papers analyzing the impact of federal procurement policies, including the SIBR program, on small businesses. The SIBR program is marketed as a way for innovative small businesses to break into the public sector. Yet most SIBR funding goes to existing government contractors. Task a group of the world's most accomplished entrepreneurs with identifying and responding to a phase one, and you'll understand why. The process is so arcane that irrespective of IQ or business acumen, it's nearly impossible for an outsider to navigate. Many small businesses forego SIBR entirely. Others hire SIBR advisory firms to manage the process in exchange for a percentage of the award funding. It's also why a handful of companies win the lion's share of SIBRs. A recent GAO report showed that a mere 22 companies, less than 1% of all SIBR participants, won more than $3 billion in SIBR funding between 2011 and 2020, roughly 10% of the entire SIBR budget. The program is designated for small businesses, Yet some of these entrenched SIBR companies generate hundreds of millions in government contracting revenue annually, and some are even publicly traded. Both we and the GAO found that these entrenched SIBR companies don't necessarily transition at higher rates. One firm we analyzed won over $320 million in Phase 1, Phase 2 funding and has generated only $10 million in Phase 3s. The SIBR program isn't held accountable for meeting explicit intragovernmental transition goals, so these large cyber companies that understand the system aren't incentivized to transition. They're incentivized to pursue more cybers. However, for the truly small companies that do manage to break into the program, it's often with the expectation that good performance will translate into follow-on government contracts. Yet the program rarely positions them for success in the broader federal market. They don't receive the resources or guidance needed to identify transition partners. SAM.gov is poorly designed and has archaic search functionality. It only searches for exact terms within the title and description fields, not the attachments, which is where government stakeholders often outline their needs. In 2021, we analyzed the readability of over a million archived solicitations, and less than 4% were written in plain English, meaning small companies can't even wrap their heads around what the government is looking for. Similarly, 70% of the analyzed solicitations required responses within 21 days of when they were posted, and 30% within 10 days or less. Ultimately, the only way for most small cyber companies to win follow-on contracts is if they pay to play. Compounding this challenge, government stakeholders rarely receive information about the cyber funded projects within their branch, let alone what's being funded externally. You can't expect capabilities to transition if prospective transition partners don't know they exist. To address these issues, I offer the following recommendations. Overhaul the SIBR submission process so that small, non-traditional companies can compete. Mandate that a share of phase ones be awarded to companies with no prior government business. If the SIBR program is intended to serve small businesses, eligible companies should be small. Limit the SIBR program to companies with $40 million or less in total annual revenue. Make it easier to identify and bid on government contracts. Redesign SAM.gov, improve its search functionality, require solicitations to be written clearly, and give companies at least 30 days to respond. 
prioritize and incentivize transition, mandate that SBIR must meet minimum intragovernmental transition goals, establish a set-aside program requiring government stakeholders and prime contractors to allocate a share of contract dollars annually to cyber companies who pass a rigorous assessment of technical merit at the end of their phase two, provide greater incentives for integrating capabilities initially funded by a different branch. These recommendations stand to benefit small businesses and government. They will make the program more open and competitive and encourage wider adoption of cyber-funded capabilities. Thank you again, Chairman Williams, Chairman Muser, Ranking Member Landsman, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to speak. Thank you very much. Uh, we now recognize Mr. Palmer for his five-minute opening remarks. Good morning, Chairman Muser, uh, Chairman Williams, uh, Ranking Member Landsman, and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Brett Palmer. I'm president of the Small Business Investor Alliance. Since 1958, SBIA has been the champion of small business investment companies, the America's original venture capital and private equity funds. Our association's purpose is to support the entire small business investing ecosystem, and our policy goals are focused on maintaining a robust, healthy, and competitive market. Our members help, and grow, uh, our members help small businesses grow, and they are rightly proud of what they do and how they do it. And they're, and they're proud of the benefits that their actions have on the people in their communities where their businesses are located. SBICs are an American success story, an example of successful public policy that aligns the power of private markets with the public interest of job creation, economic growth, and global competitiveness. Over the years, SBICs have made over 200,000 investments, totaling over $130 billion, creating millions of American jobs. And SBICs provide many types of capital, including growth equity, minority equity, control equity, mezzanine and private debt, as well as some venture capital and venture lending, and more of that is coming. SBIC investments are often the first institutional capital to ever be deployed into the small business. Further, once SBIC capital is invested into a small business, then the small business is able to access more conventional bank capital. Small businesses that receive SBIC investments have grown into icons of American industry, including Federal Express, Apple, Intel, Callaway Golf, and many others. And while these are known globally, many more that were backed by SBICs have grown from smaller businesses into robust, sustainable mid-sized businesses. For example, Drug Free Sport International is based in Kansas City, Missouri. They provide drug testing services that keep athletics fair and safe. Their employment grew 242% after the SBIC investment, with their sales growing by 143%. JSI manufacturers in Milo, Maine, they sell grocery store displays. They doubled their employment to over 200 employees in a town with a population of around 2,000. Hart Systems in Hopog, Long Island, a provider of inventory management systems, they increased their employment 77 percent from 69 to 122. And Behavioral Innovation Systems in Dallas, Texas, was founded by three clinicians, two of whom are women. They, provided, they provide therapy uh, to children with autism, and they now help thousands of children across Texas, Oklahoma, and Colorado, and now have over 2,000 employees. The SBIC program is a private capital amplifier. Most SBICs are levered funds, which means those SBICs are able to borrow money from an SBA credit facility. The private sector leads and the SBIC leverage follows and amplifies. Individual SBICs can reinforce their private capital with up to two tiers of leverage or $175 million in capital, whichever is less. And I want to stress that this leverage is provided at zero subsidy to the taxpayer, and SBICs pay it back, all back, plus interest and fees. For all companies, small businesses in particular, access to capital often determines success or failure. And the private capital markets are tight right now, and they're particularly tight for small businesses due to higher interest rates, and SBICs are filling some of the capital gaps with record investments that, have been, that we've done in recent years. SBA has made several recent uh, major reforms uh, uh, and has several initiatives to increase equity capital and to diversify the type of investors that can become SBICs. Further, SBA recently announced the Critical Technologies initi Initiative, which is a partnership with the Department of Defense. This is using SBICs to increase investments in small businesses in critical national security and industries and supply chains, not necessarily government contracting, just businesses that industries we want here. Now, there are several policies that we encourage Congress to support, and the first one I'm going to actually thank you all for voting for, because everyone here did vote for it. Uh, you voted for the, the uh, Investing in Main Street Act, and which passed the House with overwhelming bipartisan support earlier this year. That was led by Representative Chu and Garbarino, and we're working on that in the Senate now. We also strongly support H.R. 5333, the Investing in All of America Act. This is also bipartisan legislation introduced by Chairman Muser and Skelton, and many members of this subcommittee are co-sponsors. If passed into law, it will bring more private capital into parts of America that are often overlooked with some of the following benefits. There's no new spending, there's no new mandates, no new subsidies, no subsidies at all, in fact. 
It's market-led and market-driven. 100% of the investments are in American small businesses. And it encourages investments in low-income areas, rural areas, and areas of national security importance. And the inflation adjustment allows the program to remain competitive and operational as inflation marches on and time marches on. So today, there are nearly 320 SBIC licenses, managing over $42 billion in domestic investment. This is extremely strong and getting stronger. There are currently 94 license applications that are in the licensing pipeline. To put that in context, SBA normally licenses in a normal year 25 to 28 licenses, and there are 94 in the pipeline coming through. The demand for small business capital is there, and the market is following it. That's about 15 to $20 billion of additional small business investment that's coming online in the next couple of years once those get through the licensing process. So I want to thank the, uh, the chairman for having this hearing, thank you, uh, the ranking member for being here as well, and, and the full chairman for joining us for this hearing. Take your, happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Palmer. Uh, we now recognize Mr. Glover for his five-minute opening remarks. Good morning, Chairman, Chairman, Ranking Member. Thank you for the opportunity of appearing here today. <clears throat> I'm Jerry Glover, the Executive Director of the Small Business Technology Council. I got my experience, uh, early experience in the federal innovation uh, and technology area back in 1978 when I staffed a joint Senate and House committee and report that documented clearly the underutilization of small business by the federal R&D programs. The, um, next to the GI Bill after World War II, I believe the SBR program is one of the most significant pieces of legislation Congress has ever passed. Why is it so significant? Well, one, it revolutionized the way government does business. For the first time, there was a law that required federal agencies to award a very small percentage of their R&D budgets to small business. This resulted in the creation and support of tens of thousands of new innovations and in small businesses. The benefits of this to the American innovation economy have been tremendous. Two technologies that you use every day. Uh, one is the GPS on a chip, which is in your cell phones and on your cars, allows you to track what's going on. The other is the CMOS system, which is the cameras, which are on virtually all cell phones. Those are just two examples of the technology. 38% of SBI awards go to new firms every year. That amounts to 1,500 new companies that had never gotten an SBR before winning an SBR award. Uh, 99 new drug approvals in the last 24 years were funded by SBIR. And if you think those were unimportant drugs, 16% of the priority review drugs, meaning those that had made significant ad health advances over prior treatments, were again funded by the SBIR program. When we also we look at the return on investment, uh, several economic impact studies have clearly shown that the return on investment is about 25%. For every dollar invested in the SBIR program, there are $11 of commercial sales, non-government sales, at the National Cancer Institute and $3 of non-government sales at the Department of Defense. 8% of all venture capital investments go to funds that have received SBIR funding. Over half of the SBIR Phase II awards go on to be successful. For every dollar invested in the SBIR program, over $3 in taxes are paid state and local. Over 2,800 firms, SBIR firms, and their technologies have been acquired. Over 800 of these SBIR firms have gone public. SBIR firms have acquired 149,000 patents. The purpose of the Small Business Innovation Research Act is to stimulate innovation to use small business to meet federal research and development needs, to foster and encourage participation by minorities and disadvantaged persons, uh, to increase technology innovation, and to increase private sector commercialization innovations that derive from research and development. Has SBR achieved these goals? Yes. In 18 National Academy of Sciences that the government spent over $20 million to fund over the years, They've looked at these goals and determined that, yes, they meet all of these goals, with the exception of women and socially and economically disadvantaged small businesses. Recent data from SBA, however, indicates that they're making significant progress. A 33% increase in the socially disadvantaged firms winning SBRs 
and an 18% increase in women-owned businesses. Why does it work? Why does SBIR work? Merit selection based on science and technology. The best proposal wins. The, the, um, um, it is highly competitive, extremely competitive. Only one in 12 proposals get to phase two. SBI solves our, uh, federal R&D challenges and supports the agency missions. Agencies select the topics, select the winners, and make awards to meet their needs. University and small business partnerships uh, drive SBR and SDTR solutions. While some people may focus on the big end of the funnel and fight over the crumbs as to who gets what, we need to focus more on the small end of the funnel and make sure that the primes start adopting outside technology or we have a serious problem. Recommendations. First, SBR should be made permanent. Secondly, the proposal and contracting process should be simplified and standardized. The SBR allocation should be doubled, and the, uh, for improved transition, prime contractors should be required to use and report on the use of SBR and non-traditional firms. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will now move to member questions under the five-minute rule. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Palmer. I'll start with you. Real world examples of what the SBIC has uh, meant to the overall organization, uh, meant to the SBIC, uh, individual companies, and to those that they were providing investments to, and how would the bonus leverage improve things and benefit small business access to capital? Sure. Um, the SBIC capital, as I mentioned, is the first institutional capital to go into most businesses. So a lot of this is professionalizing the business and helping them scale up. So it, the, the number of employees increases significantly in almost every case. I can't think of a case where it hasn't been, which has been helpful. Now, the bonus leverage um, is designed specifically to make it so there's an incentive, not a mandate, but an incentive to look off the beaten track to parts of the country that haven't been invested in. So if you have a fund, the funds have a 10-year lifespan, five five years of which they invest and then five years they harvest. In the first five years, that's an incentive to look out for low-income areas and rural areas and industries that are in these national security sectors. And if you find a business there that you might not have otherwise gone to, you can access more leverage and doesn't preclude you from doing another deal. And so it just is an incentive to look off the beaten track and find more companies in places that otherwise often get passed over. Sure. Uh, and in your opinion then, would the SBA, by implementing bonus le leverage, as drafted in the legislation, investing in all of America Act, uh, my bill, H.R. 533, would that be advantageous in the manner that, that it's intended? It would be very constructive. It would be very constructive for every state in the union. Okay. Uh, adjusting the leverage caps, um, is that, you believe that's necessary within the SBIC program? Yeah, so the leverage caps were, allowed, some of them were adjusted as, uh, back in 2015, some in 2018. Uh, and basically, as inflation has carved up and chewed up 25% of the SBIC firepower mm. as far as the le under the leverage caps. And so as time marches on, there just needs to be an inflation adjuster so that they can continue to, to operate the way they would because just time catches up. Mr. Glover, congratulations on everything you've done over time for, for small business. It's appreciated. Do you, do you agree with what, what Mr. Palmer is saying? I do. It's been the goal of the founders of the SBIR pro pro uh, program forever to have venture capitals focus specifically on SBIR firms. A few have done that. Obviously, many of them do it some, but to have some of them that are specifically focused on equity funding, the, the small SBIC program, we've, we've, we talked about this, we've worked on it, we've dreamed about it for 40 years. And so I'm glad that you are making some steps to make that happen, and I hopefully we get to see this legislation going. Good. Yeah, Thanks. you're going to see a lot more equity investor funds coming in the pipeline. There are a significant number of those at that 94 that I mentioned. Sounds good. Mr. Valletta, uh, SBIC, private investments, fueling the development and inv innovation of your small business clients? Uh, yes. Uh, the uh, These America C funds are um, paramount to small business innovation as well as growth. And for organizations like ours that are uh, venture investment and development organizations, uh, it's extremely important because part of our, a portion of our funding comes from public sources like state government, public authorities or bonds, and federal programs like the Small Business Credit Initiative, the SSBCI, uh, very important programs. 
Uh, now, as we know, most venture development organizations receive um, and uh, returns on their investments. What we would like to do is to have a virtuous cycle of business innov- innovation as well as investment velocity to take our funds that we receive back from those investments, turn them back into SBICs and SBIRs and so forth. So removing that leverageable uh, capital requirement in regards to uh, being able to leverage those dollars for, uh, for innovation and investments. That's great. And you've really done great things for Pennsylvania over the years, so it's appreciated. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, Ms. Bresler, uh, so you gave a nice list of ideas and solutions for, for improvements. Do you find your suggestions as a significant stakeholder here are, are being heard and that we're advancing in the manner that you would see best? Thank you for the question. To some extent, yes, I'm here in the room uh, with this audience. And... Um, Unfortunately, I think some of the most basic recommendations are some of the hardest to implement anywhere but this room. You know, for instance, the size standards, even if you have buy-in from the people involved in these programs, they understand on paper that a company doing $350 million a year in revenue doesn't sound like a small business the way that everyday Americans view small, they don't have the ability to implement that change. Mm. So I I think it does depend on having, uh, you know, a a caucus of people with different, you know, uh, different interests in this broader pool to come together and implement these changes collectively. Good. We'll work on it. Uh, Thank you. My my time has expired. I'm now going to recognize Mr. Landsman for his five-minute questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, Mr. Glover, a couple of things. One, uh, these are two really uh, important programs, but they're not permanent. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the value of, of making them permanent as we look to reauthorize them? Every few years, the government... You might to grab that. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Every few years, the government thinks oh, this program is going to go away so we don't have to continue funding. We don't have to make long-range plans. We don't have to make that a critical part of our infrastructure to make innovations great. There's no question innovation and adoption by the federal government in the R&D world is not working as well as it should. We're fighting against China, and we simply aren't there. But we have one of its critical fundamental programs threaten to be going away every time and have the government think about it going away and to have the businesses not be able to plan long term yeah. is very bad. Um, also, Mr. Glover, the, the federal and state technology uh, or FAST program uh, works with our SBA uh, resource partners to provide technical assistance. Uh, does investing in resources like this help address concerns about diversity in the program? And, and the next question gets at some of the um, – uh, re- really compelling points uh, that Ms. Bressler brought up uh, in terms of diversifying, uh, opening this up. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about um, some of the things that she mentioned in terms of uh, the uh, update to the process, Sim- just simplifying uh, a whole host of things that would make it more competitive uh, and, uh, and and address some of the concerns she raised. Um, and she, I ask about the tech, uh, technical assistance in that context because, you know, one hand, the technical assistance I'm sure is, 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 is terribly important. On the other hand, the assertion, if I was correct, is that there is um, uh, some folks have more of an advantage than others uh, as, as they get that technical assistance. Well, first to answer your question about FAST, I think FAST is a critical, well-spent. I think that, it's quite frankly, that it should be increased. I think that, quite frankly, there should be some sort of regional development under the FAST program to help the, other, the FAST operations. I believe that a the FAST program is responsible for the significant increase. Sorry, not in to, I, I apologize. Can you repeat the regional piece? Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, I, I, d- 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 you would have some sort of super fast programs that help work with other n- smaller fast programs. Oh, I see. And uh, quite frankly, 125000 or whatever it is is just simply not enough to run a really good program. So you need somebody to help you, show you how to do it. 
That's maybe one or two people, uh, so that's not enough. But it has had a critical impact because we're seeing minorities and we're seeing women-owned businesses numbers going up significantly and fast as a critical part of that. As to far as to the participation, you know, 1,500 new firms every year. That's a lot of new firms. So we're getting a lot of companies in. Are we perfect? Nothing ever is. In my opinion, it's the best program in federal R&D ever created because it has less, it has a huge return on investment. Over $3 in taxes alone come back from these programs. So the government picks the companies, they pick the tech topics, they pick the winners and they choose. In many cases, especially in defense, there are technologies that are very sophisticated and the government needs that. And quite frankly, the primes aren't providing it. So it's important to have those companies with the knowledge, experience and background and equipment and experts to meet those government needs. Commercialization is one of four goals, only one. Getting a small business percentage, and as far as size definitions, the SB, the, the, the general SBI, uh, 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 the, the general size standards at SBA for R and D is a thousand to fifteen hundred, not five hundred. SBA looking at this and all the criteria would be more likely to increase the size standard, not lower it. So let me uh, thank you for that. Um, we're, I, I, I'm running out of time, but what I think would be good. <laughs> is if somehow we can get the two of you in a room and uh, sort out what the changes would be. I know that you have different feelings, but it does seem like that could be a very helpful uh, uh, thing as we look to uh, reauthorize, update, improve uh, the process uh, from application to uh, scoring uh, to, I think, Ms. Breslow, you talked about having a group that could help um, uh, sort through some of this uh, so that it's not just the same folks. I don't know if you'd be interested in that. Maybe our team can follow up with the SBA to, to or, or this committee to talk through it, but I, I think that could be very helpful. I think that's a very good idea. Thank you. I will look forward to it. Gentleman Yields, uh, I agree. I think it's a very good idea as, as well. Uh, we now recognize Chairman Williams from Texas for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, Ms. Bresser, I'm a small business owner back in Texas, uh, IQR, and you used some words today that the federal government doesn't understand, okay? It's called easier, <laughs> faster, and incentivized. They, they don't get that, okay? They only hear it from the private sector. So uh, the Department of Defense SBR program when often lacks instructions for small businesses to follow. Uh, you've, you've said that, and yeah, I agree with you. We've heard from many frustrated small business owners who have left with more questions than answers about the requirements and what would be needed for follow-up on contracts, when to apply for the SBR program, or even when, which DOD innovation initiative actually they should use. So this causes many small businesses, as you talked about, uh, to walk away uh, from the defense market and not participate in the program because they do not have a clear picture of what the full investment will be and cannot justify navigating the complicated regulations. So simply... Uh, how can this concern be addressed and how widespread is the issue? Thank you for the question. So I think the easiest way to assess this would be trying to go through this process yourself, having as many people who are involved in designing the process actually go through it and make notes. I think relative to some of the complex technological challenges that the Department of Defense tackles on a daily basis, this is relatively simple, but the cultural piece is significant. Yeah. And you would need to look at not only creating the appropriate systems, policies, having the right tools, but also requiring that new steps be taken, requiring certain metrics to be tracked. So even this notion of how many new businesses are working in the CIBR program every year, the reason you can hear different numbers is because there isn't a standard way right. in which they track that, for instance. Uh, Mr. Valletta, your testimony indicated that several hurdles remain to make the SBIC program cumbersome, that make it cumbersome, including the limitation and definition of legible capital, which could be broadened and made clearer. What, uh, what would you recommend we do on this committee to fix this particular issue? Actually, uh, thank you for that question, uh, uh, Chairman. Uh, we, um, 
we really look for the SBIC program to be expanded from that leverageable capital with uh, using uh, the venture investment development org organizations like ourselves uh, to be able to uh, use that capital, the returns that we receive from programs, uh, various programs from state and local and federal, uh, to be able to get that velocity of investments uh, from organizations. And then on the SBIR and STTR type of programs, leveraging those organizations to uh, make it clear, as uh, Ms. Bressler mentioned, uh, in regards to maybe using an IPART program, those innovation partnerships like we have uh, in, uh, in our program at Ben Franklin uh, to make the process easier and uh, to note that we have a 28% success rate versus the national average of 18%. So uh, I think uh, all those things combined make it easier for our, uh, the communities that we serve to refresh, retain, and reimagine jobs for our great country. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Thank Palmer. You. Uh, our government spending is currently on an unsustainable path, in case you were not aware of that. I'm aware of that. Okay. Yes. Overspending poured gasoline on the inflation fire every single day. Every American is currently experiencing uh, uh, these high interest rates, for a dec and they're going to be decade long. Uh, simply, how does the current economic climate affect the performance and, and viability of the SBICs? Uh, the SBIC, the demand for SBIC capital is extremely strong because the banks have been have, have had to pull back. Um, the banks are, uh, particularly the smaller and regional banks, are struggling with uh, still loss of deposits. Uh, that's a challenge. Um, and the businesses that have floating rate loans, uh, their costs have gone up significantly. So I was talking to a fund manager the other day. They had a business that was growing at 40 percent a year, you know, just rocking and rolling. They're down to 5 percent growth. Just, changes entirely on interest rates, just the cost of borrowing capital to grow. Um, and uh, and that's, that's hard. Uh, but in, uh, inflation is, is difficult on consumers, uh, and it's difficult on businesses to plan, uh, and, it's, and it's a challenge. Uh, real quick, with the time I got going uh, as a follow-up, uh, I always look at when evaluating any government program or anything is a return on investment, which they don't understand about here in, in Washington. But for those people that may not be familiar with the SBIC program, can you, can you tell us quickly if any taxpayer dollars have been lost and what would have to occur the federal funds be wiped out in this program? Sure. Excellent question. So the, uh, it's a zero subsidy program. So by law, it cannot. Um, uh, we have to char they charge additional fees on top of it. Uh, there are hundreds of millions of dollars, maybe a billion dollars to the positive uh, that, uh, as far as excess fees versus losses that are there. But the key to the program that makes it work and be taxpayer protection is that the private capital has to be lost first before the taxpayer is exposed. And frankly, I think that should be true for just about any government program that's existing because you should have your own money at risk before anybody gets exposed. I now recognize Representative Chu from California for five minutes. Mr. Palmer, thank you for your steadfast support for my and Representative Gabarino's bipartisan bill, the Investing in Main Street Act, which would amend an outdated law to finally allow financial institutions to invest up to 15 percent, triple the current limit of 5 percent of their capital and surplus into SBICs. And this will help SBICs, I believe, immensely. The House has overwhelmingly passed this common sense change for several Congresses in a row now. Can you discuss why this bill is so needed and what the impact would be on our small business investment ecosystem if the Senate were to finally take up this bill and pass it into law? Well, first and foremost, thank you for your leadership on it. It's, it would be incredibly helpful. It's just a glitch in the law that different parts of the law were written at different times. So banks are allowed to invest in SBICs so that the money can go to small businesses, but the SBICs aren't allowed to accept it, which is just silly. It's just a percentage uh, question. And so uh, thanks to your leadership, it's passed several times. Uh, the Senate is very difficult to get anything through. There's no cost associated with it. But uh, as I, uh, I was saying in my testimony, there's over 90 fund SBIC funds in the licensing pipeline currently. They normally license around 25 a year. Demand for this capital is off the charts. These funds have to raise, and they need to raise from banks. And there are a lot of banks that would like to invest more, but they're just not allowed to, not because the banking law says they can't, it's the SBICs can't accept it. So it would be very helpful in getting more private capital that would then be amplified through the small business ecosystem. And how it, would it help small businesses? There would be more capital available. 
uh, frankly, uh, there'd be more equity capital available uh, under the new programs that the SBA has rolled out, the new, the new models for debentures. Uh, there'd be more debt capital available too, uh, and there'd be more capital in underserved areas that are currently aren't being capitalized. Um, well, thank you for that. And Mr. Palmer, I was encouraged to hear in your testimony that the, at the end of fiscal year 2023, the amount of capital that SBIC has invested in small business was at record levels, and that about a quarter of those investments were in min minority women and veteran-owned small businesses, or those located in low to moderate income areas. However, despite this promising growth, we know that these types of underserved small businesses still face significant barriers in accessing investment capital. For example, one um, study found that the average amount of new equity investment in minority-owned businesses is only 43% of the average equity investment in non-minority businesses. As another example, in 2020, black and Hispanic female entrepreneurs received less than half of 1% of venture capital investments. So can you discuss how the SBIC program can help close those gaps and what changes in the program might be needed? Sure. Um, and actually, the, the SBA um, changed their regulations last fall, created a couple new models uh, of the SBIC uh, program underneath the existing debenture program that will allow for more equity investing because SBICs do invest at a higher rate in women and minorities in equity and in venture than does the broader venture market. Uh, and so that they'll be able to do more of that. That's helpful. Um, I think also um, uh, one of the things they came up with is this reinvestor SBIC, sort of a fund of funds model. It's, it gets a little complicated, but basically it's almost like a uh, developmental league or a seed league that they're, that they're setting out there to help develop new smaller funds in smaller areas. Also, uh, Congressman Muser's bill, um, the Investing All of America Act, has a specific uh, incentive to invest in geographies that are low income or rural. Uh, and that's going to benefit more, more folks there, too. So I think you, you're going to see some – there's no quick fixes, uh, but I think over the next five years, you're going to see a meaningful uptick in a lot of those areas. So I take it you're in support of the, this rule, the SBIC Investment and Diversification and Growth Rule. It's been very constructive, yes. Okay, very good. Um, Mr. Glover, uh, we know that underserved small businesses remain underrepresented wi within the SBIR STTR programs. Um, as a lead coordinating agency for SBIR and STTR, what steps do you re recommend that the SBA take to enhance education and outreach to these groups? The, the SBA, uh, to my knowledge, in the last few years has gone out to historic black colleges, gone out to areas like that, and done a really good job. And the numbers show that they are increasing. Uh, the, the social disadvantaged numbers are up 33 percent. Women-owned businesses are up 18 percent. So we're seeing improvement. They need to do more of that. And quite frankly, the SBIR program is underfunded at, 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 uh, at SBA. They have very few people working there and very little money and, and a lot of work to do. But they're doing a good job of making that happen. But I think with more resources and more people, the SBIR office could do a lot, mo lot more. Thank you. I yield back. And Lady Yields, uh, we're now going to move into round two of our questions. So, Ms. Bressler, I'm going to recognize myself for five minutes and start with you. Um, SBIR access and awareness for small businesses. I'm sure you've got a couple of things to say about that uh, and how to improve it and get more businesses to participate in the program. Could you offer some of your suggestions? Thank you for the question. First and foremost, we have to establish metrics that require the program to award a certain share of contracts, phase ones every year, to new businesses that have never worked in the government space. That would force these program offices to do some of the hard work of not going with the usual suspects. And that is critical. There needs to be metrics, there needs to be requirements, and they need to be held to account. In terms of the actual work to reach these businesses that have not previously participated in the program. Um, it comes down to awareness in general. I think my experience is that it's an echo chamber. If you go to a program where you're going to learn something about SBIR, you look around and it's the same people that are in every room just like it, learning about SBIR over and over again. So you have to put yourself in front of audiences that are not already entrenched in these processes. And I think really, putting uh, intelligent size standards in place where you can't have multi-billion dollar publicly traded companies participating in the SIBR program will again force the program offices 
to be more effective in their outreach to truly small firms? All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Palmer, do you run into some of the same situations with the SBIC? Um, the rules can be complicated. Um, they can be unclear. Um, they've gotten better, uh, significantly better. Um, but it's, uh, but trying, trying to broaden out the awareness of the SBIC program is hard. Uh, uh, you know, and I think that that's, uh, that goes to, 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 to Ms. Bressler's point, is, you know, breaking out of the echo chamber. Uh, and I spend a lot of time traveling around the country trying to educate on that front. Um, the SBA actually does some of that too, which I th has found constructive. Um, to Mr. Glover's point, I think, you know, parts of the SBA, uh, particularly the SBIC program, they are underfunded. They do have um, too few people doing too much stuff. Uh, and when they're overstretched, that's a challenge. So I think having a few more people that can do outreach and education and putting stuff in plain English, to, to Ms. Bresser's point, is really critical so people can understand these otherwise complicated programs. Okay, Mr. Valletta, you're, I know how close you are to it all. Could you comment on this? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, absolutely, uh, con uh, Congressman. Uh, we, we believe the SBIR and STTR award capabilities uh, could be uh, better suited um, with leveraging organizations like the Innovation Partnership, the IPART program that I mentioned. You know, we have 20 years of assisting Pennsylvania small businesses and uh, the complexity of the, uh, uh, the application process is real. And those small businesses uh, and creating those programs to increase the quality of proposals, provide better customer service and drive that uh, program applicants to improve the effectiveness uh, is, is real and very important. So uh, organizations across the country like ours, the IPART program assists, right? So uh, we, Ben Franklin, um, provide funding for this IPART program across the state uh, to increase the level of those submissions so we can uh, increase the level of wins, which I stated in the past that we, uh, we have a win rate of 28% versus 18%. So, uh, so that uh, the capabilities of uh, organizations like the Innovation Partnership uh, uh, reaps benefits for uh, the constituents that we serve. Right. I want to ask something about the uh, TCGA, the uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act. Uh, we uh, passed a, a bill in the House uh, regarding bonus depreciation, 100% R&D reduction, as well as uh, dealing with the uh, small business tax deduction. <clears throat> it's, I hope the word languishing is too strong. I hope it's being dealt with within the Senate. Mr. Palmer, just, just quickly, your, your thoughts on the importance of the passage? Uh, I think it'd be very helpful, particularly that R&D side. A lot of smaller businesses that do research and development uh, were surprised at sort of the, the way that the tax law was being applied. And so I think it would be very helpful, particularly that, for small businesses doing really innovative stuff. Thanks, Mr. Valletta. Yes, actually, uh, uh, it's real. And our uh, small businesses beg us to work with our uh, local lawmakers as well as our federal lawmakers to uh, to get that passed, uh, especially in the Senate. Thanks. So, agreed. Mr. Bressler? Thank you. Thoughts? I, I think it's uh, probably further down in terms of the bottlenecks that the small businesses that I'm working with deal, deal with, mm -hmm. but um, anything to offset the burdens of working with the government or trying to operate in an, uh, today's economy are important. Thanks. Uh, my time has expired. I now recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the, so, uh, I heard we're sort of in problem-solving uh, consensus mode here and, and, and trying to be as – and that was the purpose of the hearing. So, again, want to thank the chair for doing this. It's is, is incredibly helpful uh, and the staff uh, f f for putting this together. Um, it seems like there is some consensus on – the importance of diversifying and 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 including more and more uh, uh, businesses, small businesses, it's happening. The question is, you know, what more can be done? Uh, I I assume that this idea of measures and accountability to to um, uh, to see more and more of that is is probably worth pursuing. How it's pursued is a question. Uh, the awareness piece uh, and outreach uh, gets at something I, I think most people have said or most of you have said, which is that there is a staffing uh, issue and, and, and how, do you, how do you ensure that the, 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 the programs have the staffing they need or, or the resources to, 
get in front of these small, some of it can be uh, staff, but a lot of it is, you know, the, we, so many of these folks are on, well, everyone's online. And, and, and is there the kind of digital outreach uh, that have, has proven to be incredibly successful in other programs to get in front of the uh, intended audiences? The simplification of the process from application to uh, to what's on the website, uh, s there seems to be consensus there. So I'm curious uh, if what pieces, are, and, and maybe just go across the board and finish with you, Jerry. Sorry, Mr. Glover. Um, if you could pick three big changes, or, or small, but changes that you would think would have the most impact, what would those three be? And then uh, and then we'll we'll end with Mr. Glover and and and, and just get your thoughts on um, those changes and, and how we can make them happen because it does seem like there's consensus on areas for improvement. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you for that question. Uh, we, from from my perspective, um, being able to drive the uh, dollars to. Uh, venture investment development organizations and, and changing the uh, complexity uh, with allowing us to leverage the uh, capital of, of uh, investments that we receive from our investments, right? That would be one. Second uh, is that uh, really driving the um, uh, the investments to below $3 million, right? So we at uh, Ben Franklin invest in very early stage, so it's important that um, and, and we're typically the first dollars in after friends and family, so that would be the uh, second change. Uh, and then the third uh, and important uh, is um, uh, the requirement for being non uh, for being for profit. We're nonprofit, so it's important that uh, maybe some nonprofit organizations uh, can get into the game. Gotcha. Very helpful, Ms. Mm Bresner. -hmm. Thank you. First would be overhaul the size standards, which I've discussed. Yep. The second would be a full overhaul of the government solicitation process, which would include SIBR submissions as well as every type of solicitation that the government issues. And then third is incentivizing transition of the best and brightest technologies, specifically bringing the primes into the mix so that government stakeholders and prime contractors are required to integrate a certain subset of SIBR funded companies that have demonstrated their technical proficiency and to encourage um, a breakdown of these stovepipes that have been challenging to deal with, offer a greater incentive to integrate something initially funded by a different branch. Got it. Mr. Palmer, thank you. Um, first, I'd say nothing should change that, that reduces taxpayer protections in any way, shape, or sure. form. That is foundational. Yes. But I think we should, you know, the, the passage of the Investing All America Act, being, uh, adjusting those leverage limits would be incredibly helpful. Um, expediting the licensing process for repeat funds so that they're, they're spending their time for new funds coming in and not people they've known forever. And then finally, you know, having, as far as adequate funding for it, keeping the fees that we're paying inside the program that we're paying for, ah, because smart. we're the only one that's yeah, not. Yeah, smart. Mr. Glover. First, if you want to increase the diversity and things, double the program. It hasn't been increased in over a decade. Uh, it should be increased. That will quickly double the number of new firms, number of minorities, and so forth proportionally. Uh, secondly, make the primes use SBR new technology and incorporate it. They are, the law lets them do that. The law encourages them. Army has just started doing it a little bit. You got one more. Sorry. And number three, uh, it is we've tried for years and we got into the law, simplify, standardize the contracting and procedures. Okay. But I've got to say the 174 deduction issue is going to blow up in everybody's face because once you realize you're going to pay taxes up front, on work you don't get, you know, profits you don't get downstream, it's devastating. Thank you all very much. Gentlemen Yields, yes, uh, thank you all very much. Um, we want to uh, just uh, formally thank you, all of our witnesses, for all of your testimony here today. Uh, without objection, uh, members have five legislative days to submit additional materials and written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses. And we do ask the witnesses to do your best to uh, respond promptly. Um, today, uh, there's a lot going on, which tends to be the case here in Washington these days. So we didn't have uh, all that many uh, members within the committee because of other uh, duties uh, that were, were compelling. Um, 
but we uh, we greatly appreciate the information that was received. I think that questions were were, were excellent, and I think we derived a lot of the um, ideas uh, that we will work on, and we will continue to work on, as was as was mentioned. So, if there is uh, no further business without objection, the committee is adjourned. Thanks for the rest. Jerry, good seeing you. Good seeing you again. Thank you very much.